You ever think about quitting? It's the combat of life, hammering the snot out of you. Well, stand by, dig in deep, and get ready to get fired up with us. Welcome to the Team Never Quit Podcast, the number one podcast that inspires you to fight on. I'm your host, David Rutt Rutherford, here with Mr. Never Quit himself, Marcus Luttrell. Our mission is to help you embrace the suck of life, to teach you the values of working your ass off, and to interview the most hard-charging people on planet Earth. We know life is hard. It's time for you to suck it up, buttercup, and let us teach you to persevere in every environment imaginable by sharing real-world lessons learned by those who never quit. That's right. It's time, Marcus, for us to help them defeat the well, negative you insurgency me up, man. in their lives. You fire me up. Are you ready? I'm ready. Let's roll. Let's roll. Man, Marcus, have we got a doozy today, bud. I mean, this show is going to rank up there with the greatest shows on earth. Wow. Right? This show <laughs> is one that is going to cut through. Since Barnum's gone, it, it might be. Can Hopefully. we steal that? Do we, Wizard, check into that for us. Is that? Is that? Absolutely. Is that available? <laughs> so. I already secured it. Let me that. tell you what. If you're Stars here, now. welcome to the greatest show on earth. How, does that sound like pretty it. good? That was not bad. I like how that sounds. I like the, I like the sound. It's the greatest right. show on earth that ignites legends. Too much? Too qualified. Is, is, I think we're just, there, just aren't keep we? Keep it as the greatest show on earth. Marcus, say it one time. No, you, you got it. I got it. We're yeah, on yeah. it. Yeah. Done. So, guess what? If you're here, stand by <laughs> because I'm telling you what the guest we have here is 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 one of my personal heroes. I mean, heroes. Not only just in life, but especially in the SEAL teams. Man, this is the guy that I was like, I want to be like that dude right oh yeah me either definitely you're going into a fraternity of guys where we don't really identify ourselves as an individual even by our skill sets so you got your picture up on the wall and you're not dead and that's that's saying something <laughs> oh, all, all jokes aside that is it, this this guy is truly a legend in legend our yeah, in our legend legend period. if it applies to anyone it i remember to him. i remember the first time you know, you, you go into the team, you see his his citation, you read it, and I hope, Wizard, we're going to read that at the end of the show, right? Absolutely. All right, you see the citation. I read that through, and I'm like, damn, that sounds pretty cool. And then I started, and I went and I researched it, and I was like, holy cow, they left out a gazillion parts of it, man. Well, that's <laughs> Has an arrow at the bottom. It says point to the back. Yeah. Right the back. It's now, got an amendum to oh, yeah. it. Wait, shoot. There we go. Um, that's the best thing about when you get into the teams and then into the platoons, man, is you hear the middle of the stories. Oh, yeah. And the, guys, the true details, right? Oh, yeah. That's the best part, man. Well, it's like yours, your recovery mm. in and of itself was was insane right oh man <laughs> much less what happened before that man and b before we get into that i just want to give a, a quick shout out and a quick heads up to everybody because we have coming back at you at our fans at our the people that just simply love the patriot tour mm -hmm. we have two nights two night only this fall october 19th and 20th where are those shows going to be, buddy? New York and Philly. Holy cow. I know. And, but, Holy and I, cow. It, man, it, it's, it's with great pride that I, I say back by popular demand. Oh, man. Chomping at the bit. And the cool thing is on New York, October 19th, it'll be at the Town Hall Theater on Phil, in Philadelphia on the 20th, Miriam Theater at the Kimmel Center. If you want to buy tickets, please go to PatriotTour.com for tickets. You can get VIP tickets to, to meet all the speakers. And the speakers are Marcus, Taya Kyle, Chad Fleving, and David Goggins. Now, are you fired up to do this one more time, buddy? Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. We've been on a break. We've been on a little bit of a break, man. We, we went real hard in the paint last year. And... Uh, I said, as a matter of fact, because the kids are back in school, and that's kind of the life I'm. I said, I, if we get New York and Philly, if we, if those ever come across our bow, so to speak, I was like, I'll, I'll step back in the breach and I'll call the team up. 
And they they did. And they got it. Yeah, we got it. So, That's ladies, great. so don't miss these shows. If you're in the area, you're on the East Coast, I don't care where you are. This is a phenomenal opportunity to see the Patriot Two, perhaps one last time to go see Marcus Luttrell, Taya Kyle, Chad Fleming, David Goggins, New York City, October 19th, and Philadelphia, October 20th. All right. I think we should just chat a little bit about some of the incredible finer points of this story. I mean, this story is the story of Mike Thornton and Tommy Norris in a platoon doing some high-speed secret squirrel stuff in 1972, right? Mm -hmm. And on October 1st, they were inserted to do this pretty awesome reconnaissance of a a coastal North Vietnamese uh, base, right? Intel and capture. Right? Intel and capture, mm-hmm. potentially, right? So they go in, and they and Mike apparently handpicked two badass South Vietnamese SEAL commandos, and then they had a lieutenant put with them. And I don't know if Mike or, or Ty picked him, but he the O had to go, right? And so they get inserted, man, you know, off these junks that they were riding, and they go into shore. And remember, back then, dude, there were no Garmin Fortrexes. There was no... <laughs> I like going behind the veil. Right. Totally. It was all map studies. As you go inside there, boy. The one thing they did have was like some star, one of the starlight scopes. And oh, yeah. But still, it, that's nothing, right? But so when they hit the beach, they knew, Mike knew immediately they had inserted wrong because apparently one of the vectors that they took one of the ships way offshore out of the two ships that shot two uh, azimuths, one of them was off by a little bit. And so over those miles of getting to the shore, they hit the wrong space. So they get there, they realize wrong space. They're going to lay up, right? And they found these great sand dunes, right? And all of a sudden, this Hmm. beach patrol, this VC beach patrol comes walking like, dum da dum da dum da dum dum right? And so I guess apparently Mike was like told the South Vietnamese lieutenant, said, hey, you take this guy out, gave him the suppressed uh, like 22 or 38 or something mm-hmm. he had. Says, you take him out, I'll take the other. They split up. Mike knocks the, sh- the the heck out of his dude, zip ties. The other dude misses this guy. And he gets like 200 meters away. And and the South Vietnamese lieutenant stops up and he's in, you know, stop or I'll shoot. You know, I want to detain you. Get over here. And the dude whips around. He's got an AK-47. Yeah. What do you think happened on that one? Changes the conversation. <laughs> so this dude opens up on the South Vietnamese lieutenant and goes hauling ass into this village up this trail. Well, Mike doesn't even think. He just goes, bam, grabs his weapon, starts hauling ass after him, gets up the trail, drops down, presses two, puts him down, and then all of a sudden notices, dude, 50 guys from that village, 50 <laughs> VC are hauling ass shooting at him. He goes running back. They get in this perimeter. You know, you got uh, Lieutenant Norris, his radio operator in a minute, uh, up in the middle, put a guy on the backside rear security, one on a left flank, and then Mike's on a point working these these dunes in the front. Mm-hmm. And the fighting was so intense, brother. I mean, it was so intense. Now, Mike would literally, they'd pop their little heads up like, Four or five meters away, he'd plug one, plug another, plug. I guess he killed like seventeen guys, like like that. And he would roll from one 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 berm to the next, one berm to the next. And they were like, Jesus, how many dudes are we fighting? Right. <laughs> and and the whole time now, I guess apparently Lieutenant Norris Tommy is on the radio and he's talking to some like. Like JG on one of the the destroyers to try and get some call from fire, and the dude had never done it before. <laughs> Imagine being that new, that new guy. You're hearing the AK fire in the back. He, you know, Tom's like, uh, "Can I get this grid right?" Bah, 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 just a second. Bah, 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 you know, and it was so close that he the guy couldn't figure it out. They weren't getting the fire. Then apparently, also now it's really starting to close in. And after Mike rolled around with one berm and he's reloading his weapon and a Chicom grenade lands right next to him, right? Yeah. Homemade grenade. And listen, I'll tell you what, I, I'm a personal favorite. I, I love grenades, right? They're the greatest, coolest thing ever, especially American grenades. You throw them, one, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand, four, boom, they go off. This thing was a handmade grenade, dude. It was so it lands next to Mike. He sees it. He looks down and 
He throws it back over the berm, dude. And he's counting four one thousand five. Guess what, Marcus? Comes, <laughs> <laughs> comes right back, lands next to him. He picks it up and throws it back again, right? Now it comes back one more time. Boom! Takes seven pieces of shrapnel up and down his back. Then three dudes come running over the berm on him, right, to kill him. He shoots one, one guy upside down. He falls right next to him, shoots the other two. They fall back behind the berm. That's how the fighting was going, dude. Because they couldn't get any fight. There was some, what, they had a Ford Observer that was going to try and help coordinate? Nothing. They weren't getting it. Tommy wasn't even getting any help from that guy. Mm. Then he called in these junks to come underneath the gunfire. Because now he's like, listen, you got to start doing something. We're hurt. Because they were literally, mm -hmm. he said, the cool thing is, he'd be on a horn talking to these clowns. And then all of a sudden, they'd be overrun and he'd be in hand to hand. And there's this great video out there. All you got to do is look up Thomas and uh, Thornton and Norris, 2001, from the Academy of Achievement. And he's the way Tommy talks about it, he's like, one minute I'm, you know, I'm trying to get called for her, and then, you know, it got a little hairy. Next minute I'm in hand to hand. And I'm like, come on, guys, guy, yeah. give us some help. Like, Hold on one second. I'll be right back. <laughs> so it keeps going. Well, now, Finally, they're not getting any help. And so Tommy makes the call. All right, we get out of get a we gotta get out of Dodge. Well, about four hundred meters behind him, there's an, a solo berm. And then a mile one way, the four hundred meters, then the, the tree line's pretty far off one flank. And so they're like, All right, let's bound back to there and then we'll bound to the water, I guess, and get out of Dodge, or at least whatever. So I guess Mike and his two guys get up, they do a four hundred meter open space. Oh. leapfrog dude 400 remember i'm up they see me oh, i'm yeah. down i'm up they see, that was, I was like i'm up for about a minute yeah <laughs> like a, a guy was going through buzz he had an instructor that was a vietnam guy he just got in there and when they were doing it he you know muzzle discipline is real big you up they turn around he said when they got up turn around to, to go before they see me because he was shooting by, like behind him He's running one way and shooting that thing. <laughs> and then they go down. None of that high speed. I was like, what are you talking about, man? You're getting shot at. Get the hell out of Dodge. <laughs> just laying it down. Just laying it. Just point it behind right. me and laying He's it like, down. He's like, I was giving, man, you're supposed to lay down and give suppressive fire. Well, I was giving suppressive fire, but I ain't laying down. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So they make this giant bound, they lay down, and they're sitting there going big. And now, obviously, it was funny because, not funny, but right before this, they were looking. And because all the gunfire had happened, that North Vietnamese Army regular base sent reinforcements to the tune of about 75 to 100 guys. Yeah, they found their objective. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they did. It, it came to them, right? So then the whole tree line opens up. They're coming in from every freaking direction, right? So they get there, and, and they're going big, and now it's just it's starting to get hairy. Well, the radio operator comes and falls, kind of falls at Tommy's feet or, or Mike's feet, and he looks down, and he's like, hey, where's LT? And he looks up, hey, Dowie's dead or Lieutenant's dead. And so without even a second thought, brother, without a second thought, he says, okay, I'll be right back. Cover me. And he gets up. And what's he do? 400 meters yeah. back across yeah. open terrain, back to the dunes where literally when he came up on the dunes, he said they had surrounded the dunes. They were almost on top of Tommy. He had to kill a ton of guys. Ben's over and uh, Lieutenant Norris had been shot through the temple, exit front side. So his whole front left eye and frontal uh, part of his brain had been blown out. And so he looked dead, but... He, you know, Mike's like, uh, I'm bend down, bends down, turns to go then. But what he didn't know was just prior to Tommy had finally gotten a hold of someone on the Newport News, uh, the battleship, and they launched an eight inch shell, which as soon as Mike starts running off this berm and hits about eight meters behind him and throws him 20, 30 feet uh -huh. in the air, dude, right? He lands, he's like, I, 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 you know, trying to shake it off. And he looks over at Tommy, and Tommy opens his good eye, and he's like, Mike, buddy, you know, imagine the feeling he felt like, thank God my, my best friend's not dead, you know? And bends down, picks him up, and what's he do? <laughs> Four. A 400 yard sprint. Another 
400-yard sprint with 125 guys shooting at you. Gets down to the berm, and they're <laughs> the like... dude on his back. With a... D- uh, fragged. Oh, oh. And apparently, he got shot yeah, when he yeah, got yeah, down he got to shot, the berm yeah. again. He, he got shot one more time. So, he's been mm. blown up by a grenade, blown up by uh, an 8-inch shell. He'd been shot once. His LT's been shot through the head. And apparently, the, the, the South Vietnamese lieutenant, he had bugged out and left him. And the two guys he picked, they're still going big. So they look at him and they're like, hey, Big Mike, you know, what, what are we going to do? And he's like, well, we're going to swim for it. What do you think? Like any self-respecting frogman would, right? <laughs> so they go out to the water. And as they're going out, I guess he trips and falls. And Tommy was on his back. And now Tommy's like lands in the, in the ocean, you know, in the South China Sea. And he's like, hell, you know, I, he thought I was going to kill him instead of the gunfire. And as he's waiting out, because he's, remember, he's still firing his gun as the enemy is closing in. And he, I guess he put Tommy's head under the water because he wasn't paying attention. Then I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. But Hold he's on. Only, <laughs> but oh, he's no. only half the word. As a, as a, you know, salt, nasty water running in his, in his oh, cranium. I'm, right. I'm oh. drowning. Close your mouth. I am, but I have a huge <laughs> hole in my face. <laughs> 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 so he, he finally, they get out, and he situates Tommy, and he, he had taken off his life vest, put it on Tommy, strapped himself to his back, and then the one one of their healthy guys, because the radio operator had taken two rounds through his back, through his radio, so he had shrapnel on his back. So he's struggling. One healthy guy, on the way out, the healthy guy gets shot through his his butt, through his femur, shattered his femur. Now he can't swim, so Tom, or Mike puts him on his front, and he's holding on, got Tommy on his back, dragging the other guy. They swim something like two, 3,000 meters offshore, right? Two miles, right? Two yeah, miles. Two, two miles, miles off to get out of range of all the fire, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And they're sitting up. And, and mind you, just so you know, the, the Ford Observer had done an overflight, and the ships were like, what do you see? And he, they're like, everyone's dead. There's nobody left. So those ships, because they started taking some battery fire, they took off. So imagine your ride takes off, dude, <laughs> as you're swimming out for extract. And so they, again, after they, you just did a time to run in a, in a conditioning swim. <laughs> right? Exactly. So he gets out there. One more time, they look at Mike and they go, Mike, what are we going to do? He goes, well, we're going to keep swimming. And he swam with those three dudes for another three and a half hours. Totally supporting mm-hmm. them, totally swimming. And finally, the junks, there was another uh, a seal on board, Woody, Woody Woodrow, right? Uh, with another seal on board. And he said, he, they had patrolled a little bit, picked up that South Vietnamese lieutenant. And he said, no, they're all dead. I saw him. He said, hell no, I didn't see him dead. Kept coming. <laughs> they finally came up on, on Mike and everybody. It, apparently, it took like 10 guys to get Mike in a boat. He was so exhausted. But my favorite part of the story, the whole thing, man, and this is the thing that really, and all that is, trust me, it's miraculous in every second of it. But this is my favorite part. He didn't quit, man. He, he took Tommy all the way back to the infirmary and briefed the doc top to bottom on exactly when da- what went down through that whole thing, man. <laughs> And and that's the story. An incredible story. Well, and Tommy's a Medal of Honor recipient. Bad twenty one, right? So for, for there was the bad twenty one scenario. It was uh, Lieutenant Colonel Hamilton. It happened in April of seventy two. Tommy was on a whole different project uh, when they called him off to go rescue. It's the first time that someone met won the Medal of Honor, saving another Medal of Honor's life since the Civil War. And that story, mm-hmm. in and of itself, is the greatest personnel recovery in history, in my opinion. So, <laughs> so I mean, hey, whatever that guy's got burning inside of him, it, it's unbelievable. But you know what I love, Marcus, and we talk about this, Wizard. We talk about this all the time. It's guys like that that you think about, and because of the standard that they set, right? Mm-hmm. The standard of their commitment to their teammates, what they're willing to do, and you know, just that's the standard by which you got to live your life in the teams in particular. And and quite frankly, your life outside of teams. And I know that's even more difficult because other people don't have those standards. Right. Well, do we need to say anything else about Mike or 
I mean. Man, I just want to get the guy on and just listen to this dude talk. Yeah. What do yeah. you think, brother? Sure. Hey, I'd be in the platoon space, man, sitting back and listening to the guys before us tell stories. That's what this is. That's about to happen. Well, let's let's make it happen, brother. Wizard, let's get him on. Marcus, 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 brother, Marcus. I gotta tell you, I have been so fired up for this one. When you first said that you were gonna be able to get him on about a year ago, I've been chomping at the bit, man. Because when you not only bring one of your brothers on, one of the people from that was cut from the same cloth that is comes from where we come from, right? <laughs> But is one of the originators. Design the cloth. The design the cloth. The manufacturers who who his story, his commitment, his level of honor and integrity, man. It is the definition by which I want to wear my trident every day of my life, all day long, brother. Yeah. No, no, He's no. On. You know, you're looking at the the father. The we don't have. There's no alpha that's that is a part of us. But if you stand out, I mean, you got your picture on us. Steel team wall, that's that's saying something. Most of the guys up there are dead. <laughs> right, right. You know what I'm talking about? And growing up with I grew up with him since that's I was so since cool. I was a boy. You know, I met him right when I was going in. And he can wear that when it's time to talk to young warriors, he'll flip that switch and do that. And then you can turn around and talk to civilians as a, a, mentor, a man of the people. Yeah. yeah, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And that, <laughs> it's funny to watch civilians see him lo load into us sometimes like he does. <laughs> Because it's, I mean, you know, he's a huge guy. Yeah. So, man, he, he is, he's, he's a wonderful <laughs> treasure we have in the teams, and I'm glad we got a chance to get him on here. So what did I say? Let's just bring him on right now. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, I'd like to introduce Mr. Mike Thornton. Sir, thank you so much for coming on the Team Never Quit podcast. Well, it's my honor, guys. I tell you, I love Marcus and Morgan to death. Like I say, I, I met them both before they actually went to training, and uh, and I, I said, you know, going through training, it's not going to be an easy job. But both both those young men did, did us proud. I'm out here in Coronado, California, having our reunion, and uh, as uh, Marcus was saying, we have a bunch of young men and that are standing up to the uh, our call, and as I pass the baton on to Marcus, Marcus passed it on to these kids, and they're doing us proud. So it's my honor to be here uh, with all you great people. Thank you so much, sir. All right, sir, the way we get started with the TNQ podcast, obviously, because a bunch of knuckle draggers like us, we got to get limbered up. We got to warm up the gray matter upstairs. We got to do some mental eye ads. So what we're going to do is we're going to fire <laughs> what we call the mad minute at you now i know what you what what in our world what the mad minute is but this is a little different <laughs> if you're ready marcus is gonna fire away at you right now are you ready sir shoot on buddy shoot on <laughs> our, our, my, uh, high school mascot <laughs> high school mascot was the vikings for us Oh, really? Man, man, everybody's got tough, such a, a cool good one, man. one that is awesome that's cool all right wizard fire away all right, if you could time travel, would you go forward or backward? Where would you go? I'd go backwards. I'd like cool. to go back. I, I think uh, mm -hmm. my mentality to go back to like uh, Braveheart or even the, uh, uh, you know, you talk about the Vikings and stuff like that. I, I think that uh, when I look at myself and I think about it, I think, uh, of course, they called me the Mighty Thor when I was in the team, so I guess uh, that's the reason I'd probably go backwards. I was about to say, brother, you're Viking, all right. <laughs> he pretty much is. Every yeah. time I yeah, you know, when you see him, he's like, you know, you know that, I mean, he was a, a gun, he's gunfighter, right? Straight up warrior. He gunfighter. I mean, plain and simple, right? You know what to do be swinging an axe somebody's head back in the day, hardcore. I remember the first time. <laughs> Double axe. I remember the first time I was, at, I was in at an East Coast reunion, man. Uh, we were out, uh, we were doing my first platoon. We were out of Blackwater, right? When it opened, we went over to the thing. And I remember Mike came strolling through the party, the picnic one day. And I was just like, damn, there he is. There he is. <laughs> right? Mike. Man, you got totally. a dude walking around like, oh, totally, there he totally. is. <laughs> All right, Mike. All right. If, if you could fight one in an all out battle to the death, who would it be? Would it be Sylvester Stallone as Rambo? 
or Arnold Schwarzenegger as Commando? <laughs> well, I know them both. I know Arnold a lot better. I know uh, Rambo, but uh, I tell you, as you and I, we all know, when you get shot, it hurts, right, Marcus? <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, but oh. I don't think ever Rambo ever has any pain, so I probably want to fight him because uh, Commando that uh, did feel a little pain every once in a while, it looked like. <laughs> All right, good answer. Yeah, he and Only I got, he could come up with that right. answer. <laughs> he and I have, we got mm -hmm. racked in the same spot. No, you did not. And that million dollar wound right, that nobody right. gets a million dollars for. <laughs> they call that a million dollar Big <laughs> old dudes, too, man. <laughs> right. This plays right to the edge. Well, <laughs> hey, hey as, as Marcus and all of us know, I wish that we were all in the movies and uh, all, we didn't lose any guys over there. But I tell you. Thing is, uh, war is not good. There's nothing good about it, but it is what we have to do to stay, keep our country safe and free for our families and uh, and the men and women of this great nation. Amen. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, Go ahead, Marcus. Walk fire away. Yes, sir. Uh, biggest pet peeve. Uh oh, young team mm -hmm. guys. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> bud, bud students. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. Uh, I was out with a young class not too long ago, and uh, I was sitting in the middle, and somebody said, what is all those bodies, things around you? And it wasn't. They said, is that seaweed? And I said, no, those are, those are, uh, those are uh, bud students eating, uh, eating sand. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I'm just so proud of what, uh, how these kids continue to come in, and they're a lot smarter than I ever was, and Marcus and them were a lot smarter than I was, and these kids that come in are even smarter than they are. So it's unbelievable just uh, the quality of young men that we have go, still goes to the teams. It is pretty cool to watch the because we're transitioned out too. Yeah. We, we talk about this. Our we still having the lineage that this many generations in line, still the Vietnam guys. But it is true because the training evolves, and these kids coming in, man, what they're squared away with by the time they get to the team is way far ahead oh, of us. Oh, the pipeline's so right. awesome Never now. Tell it's them incredible. That to your face. No, they, no. Uh, but it was harder when we went through the whole nine yards, but yeah, he's right, man. <laughs> My <laughs> class was the hardest. Yeah, he's, of course. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. All right, Wizard, fire away. All right, sir. Let's have one item from your bucket list that you're yet to accomplish. Uh... I think I've done basically everything on my bucket list. You know, uh, 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 awesome. it's really funny. The teams gave me a lot of that, uh, being able to do that. A lot of it is, you know, like right. so I'm in McKin Mount McKinley and stuff like that. And, you know, uh, going around the world, of course, you know, I've been to 78 countries in my life and I saw a lot of stuff, but, uh, uh, I want to go back for the 75th anniversary next year for Normandy. That's uh, uh, I've been to Normandy many times, but I want to be there for the 75th mm -hmm. anniversary. And right now we're doing a thing with me and Tommy and Bob Carey. We're going to have all three of the Medal of Honor recipients from uh, uh, Vietnam together to help celebrate like kind of the 50th year oh, wow. of Vietnam. So that's going to be a lot of fun. That's going to be I, I've awesome. Met, I've never met Senator Carey. No, I haven't. I, I haven't. Just, Pay our respects, please, if you when you talk to him. I, I've never more. seen that guy. Yeah, he's awesome. he's a great he's a great guy. He's been a good friend of mine for a long, long, long since he received it. Well, I knew Bob before he lost his leg and received his medal, but he's we stay close together. So, uh, so we're looking forward to that, and we'll have fifty of the young still families up there with us. So that's a great way to celebrate it. Uh, when awesome. it, when is that, sir? That's going to be at Half Moon Bay. Uh, <laughs> Mark Kendall owns the uh, golf courses up at Half Moon. We have the Ritz-Carlton up there. And we started this uh, about eight years ago with the Navy SEAL Foundation at that time. Uh, Admiral Callan was the uh, thing, and I got involved with Mark. Mark said, I, I never served this great nation in, in a uniform, but I want to serve it now. And uh, we've raised millions of dollars up there for the foundations. So. Oh, wow. that place is great. That event awesome. is, is great. Yeah. We've been invited up there a couple. Of, so, man, that's a. That's going to be one worth going to uh, for right? sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. All right. Last question from Marcus. Fire away, bud. Fine. All right, yeah, sir. Sure. Favorite superhero. <laughs> Favorite superhero. Of course, Marcus Luttrell. I mean, who else? <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> but I, I, think, I think I think his sad faced brother might be up there too. So I. They're both they're 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 both superheroes. Uh, they uh, they I'm so proud of both the guys and uh, what they've done for our nation and uh, continue to do. Uh, we work with brain trauma guys and stuff like that. And uh, to me. Uh, a superhero, somebody keeps giving back, in which Mark and Morgan Amen. both uh, have done continuously. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, to me, uh, every day of my life is to give back. I've, I've been very uh, uh, lucky. Uh, uh, an old redneck hillbilly from the mountains of South Carolina with no high school education, and uh, what I've been able to do and, and continue giving back in my uh and uh, not just back to the team guys, but back to all our uh, men and women in uniform. Well, sir, that's the perfect segue for us. Hey, to... thanks for that, by the way. Yeah, it means that a lot. amazing. I... <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Well, sir, this is a perfect segue for us. Our, our listeners come to our show for pretty much one reason, and it's a doozy. It's, it's to come here to hear incredible guests such as yourself get on and share with our listeners, things, stories that help them face adversity, help them overcome these incredible obstacles in their lives. It really, it's just this amazing uh, community that has begun to uh, uh, gather around this show. So if you could, would you please share with our listeners, the millions of people out there, listen, your greatest never quit story or stories. Well, of course, the metal, but that's not about me. It's, to, it's about, you know, everybody's, you know, we all have good days and we all have bad days. And, and Dave, uh, uh, it's, uh, you know, the, the remarkable thing is there's only, we have obstacles and everybody has obstacles and everybody has their fears and their demons. And there's only one person that can ever stop you, and that's yourself. There's mm -hmm. always a way to get over top of it, under it, around it or something. So you just got to keep the faith. And when I say faith, I mean faith. And uh, to don't, don't be afraid, but you got to attack that obstacle. You just can't stand by and look at it. So you got to do something about obstacles in your life. And I think that talks about all of us in in, in our, our lifetime. I mean, we all could have given up, but none of us ever gave up. All of us continue to strive. And that's not just in in, in wartime. That's in everyday operations i mean and so uh, as, as i guess my uh, of course you know tommy and i talk about this all the time and uh we had the uh great honor to spend some time uh in uh the woodlands with marcus and uh a uh, bunch of times and tommy and i kind of left there and he said you know it's, well, the great thing is that we continue to do what we can possibly do. But the thing is, uh, as I tell all these kids, uh, as I was talking to a bunch of those young kids to get ready to start this new class, and uh, there's only one person that makes you quit, and that's yourself. You know, only one person rings the bell, that's yourself. So so don't ever point uh, a, a thing in some other direction. So I, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that you know, uh, we had many obstacles in time of war. We have many obstacles today in everybody's life. And the problem is we have to get surpass those obstacles and face them and then move forward with our lives. So uh, that's what it's all about. That's a great yeah. answer. And it's a great initiator for, you know, to when you think about the, the people out there and who don't have the background, right? Who don't have the training. And, and for all our listeners, please go to YouTube or to the internet and you can see Mike tell his story with, with Tommy Norris and who he saved his life in order to receive the medal of honor. Uh, and, and Tommy Norris, by the way, was also a medal of honor winner for conducting one of the greatest personnel recovery missions in the history mm -hmm. of our country. Hands down, just one of the most unbelievable feats that I've ever heard or read about and so proud but you know it it you know you were it, it hadn't happened since the civil war where one guy saved another a, a medal of honor's life is that correct mike that, that is correct that is correct david uh, you know and and and, and while well, you know what i'm uh you know no matter what the what the the issues are or what the the, the thing is is that you know uh, we all have people out there to support 
I mean, the camaraderie we, uh, and that's one great thing about Marcus's book. It's about the training we go through and the camaraderie and the fellowship and the, uh, the love that we have for each other, something deeper. I know my brother one day said, uh, I think you love Tommy more than you love me. And I said, <laughs> no, I don't love nobody anymore. And I love you. I just been through things with Tommy that I've never, you and I've never, mm. uh, actually faced together. But I know that if we had to, if you'd have been there instead of Tommy we would have faced it together uh, because I just know what type of person you are. So, uh, you know, yeah, it does give you, you know, a level uh, of clarity to see, I mean, people say that, I didn't mean to cut you off, sir, but they say, you know, I never go through that. Well, I know you, you know, I, I went through it and I know what's behind those eyes. So you can make it. Exactly. Yep. And that's what you have to tell you. You have, you have to be able to, and Marcus, you and all you guys back there have, have made it and, 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 and persevered and moved forward past the obstacles that I was talking about. So, uh, uh, that's the important thing that no matter what the, the, uh, obstacles are, only you can uh, face them and, and get by them. So, uh, you know, you feel down, get somebody to lift you up a little bit out there. I love it. We just recently had uh, Captain Charlie Plum, uh, uh, Hanoi Hilton survivor, 2,103 days on. And he was able to, you know, you start to think about the magnitude of that that level of incarceration and with the sadistic nature of those guards and how horrible they were. Um, you know, but one of the things he talks about, and I've heard you mention a couple times now, was his faith. Could you describe to our listeners how your faith played a role in your career leading through the teams and then especially, you know, after you know, that incredible, amazing day where, you know, so, you know, you were able to save basically four people's lives with your actions. Could you talk about your faith a little bit, sir? Well, I, I think, you know, I was brought up, my mother, my father, the two greatest parents in the world. My dad gave me a thing called respect and honor and stuff like that. Mother gave me faith of a uh, uh, church now. My mother's faith and my faith are two different things, but there's something out there a lot greater than any of us are. And, uh, you know, and, 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 uh, I believe in, uh, there's one great God up there. And I believe that this God protects us and looks over us. Now, while, why Marcus and I are still alive, I don't know, but somebody knows for a reason. And, uh, I don't, I don't, uh, question it. And I'm just here. So, and, and as Marcus is just here. So, you know, but there's something about you just need to keep that faith and that understanding and uh, that belief that, you know, that there's something a lot greater than me or anybody else out there. And so, you know, just be blessed that we have every day to move forward. And, you know, I'm sure Marcus at one time didn't think he'd have this beautiful family he's got and uh, Morgan the same way. And uh, I, I'm just blessed every day. And when I wake up and, uh, with the grace of God, I, I hopefully I'll wake up and I, I look forward to making something positive with my life, doing, doing something positive for others. Because uh, when we die or pass on to wherever we go to, is that uh, you know I don't see worry about how much money you've made or how much you've done this. It's usually about how you've lived your life and how you've helped people. And so that, that's Amen. the faith that I try to continue doing every day of my life. Amen. And no luggage racks on hearse. <laughs> I, I want <laughs> I, I want to I back up a little bit because you, you had mentioned it, and part one of my favorite parts about your story, sir, is 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 the fact that you you did grow up in you know the mountains of South Carolina. You you, you know with, without a degree. Can you talk about that transition of what got you into the teams and why you picked? you know, going into the SEAL route and kind of what what happened in that time, you know? Well, well, Dave, I I, I knew I wanted to join the military because my father uh, was in the Army and from 39 to, uh, 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 no, from 37 to 47. Wow. And my dad got left mm. in the Philippines. Uh, he was, and he didn't get out. He was in the Philippines from 1939 to 19, late, mid-1944. Oh my! And uh, he got—he was actually a raider. He was a—I uh, never knew anything about that. And Daddy said, "Well, 
Uh, After a couple of tours of Vietnam, oh, I've been wounded a few times. Daddy said, well, I guess you can, uh, um, since you've been wounded and you've been over there and you understand a little bit about I guess we, you and I can talk about it. He said, the, what war is all about? I said, Daddy, the first time I got shot, I knew exactly what war is all about. <laughs> nothing good about it. It sucks. Uh, <laughs> Leaves a lasting impression for the rest of your life. <laughs> Remind, yeah. Yeah, 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 you said it, Mark. It's a lasting impression. You never <laughs> forget about that first time. But uh, uh, my father was my hero, my everything, and uh, my mentor. And uh, like I said, he only had a sixth grade education, but he led by respect. And uh, I saw the crazy movie, The, Bef- uh, the Five Sullivan Brothers. I don't know if you've ever heard the story. Oh, about oh yeah. Down train. Yeah. And I always said, that sounds like my family. It sounds like my father. Family comes first, and you give up everything for your family. And then I saw that crazy movie with Richard Whitmark, <laughs> The Navy Frogman. And I was a good swimmer. And, uh, I, I Sir, good just athlete. so you know, just so right. you know, I've got that movie poster up in our studio, primarily to to honor all the frogmen that came before us right there. I just, I just, it's so awesome yeah, that you're telling that. It's actually right Mike's My dad yeah. fighting that dude with a knife. Ahead, <laughs> <laughs> but when I went through training, it was called Underwater Demolition Recruit Training. There wasn't no buds until the, uh, the, uh, the 70s. And, uh, and, uh, and when I graduated, we graduated with, uh, 22 guys and four of them got rolled back to the other class and uh they said you 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 and you and you and you and you are going to go to seal team and i said what the hell seal team i didn't i hell i didn't know what seal team was and uh <laughs> that, was, that was back in the 60s and uh of course i you you said yes sir and carried on as we all uh try to do and uh and uh there i found myself in seal team and that's how i got there and i Actually, I was the only guy. Uh, uh, I had twelve of my uh, classmates at the reunion for the Vietnam reunion, and uh, I was the only one that made a career. Everybody else got after uh, after about four years. So uh, I love the military. Uh, I don't think, as Marcus and I know, we don't do it for accolades or medals or anything like that. We do it because we care, and uh, uh, the medals mean nothing to me. I mean, I have the the great honor but what means to me is the respect of uh our seals and then respect me and said hey i want to go to a battle with that guy so uh that's what's important to mike thornton is uh is that i gain the respect of my peers and the the people uh who i operate with one of one of the greatest things that i love watching about every recipient every medal of honor recipient we had kyle carpenter on a, a few shows back and we we asked him about you know the responsibility of wearing that medal and what it means and and you know and i've heard you talk about it and tommy talk about it that you don't necessarily wear the medal for yourself at all it's nothing to do but it's all the guys that didn't make it back can you ex- can you expound on that a little bit for our listeners and help them understand the meaning of the medal and, and and what it's given, what opportunities it's given you to have greater influence in your life. Uh, you know, Dave, uh, uh, I I don't think I deserve the medal. Never will think I deserve the medal. I, I did uh, what I felt that was necessary, as Marcus did, as we all do, because our camaraderie and our uh, our, 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 our our love for our fellow. Uh, comrades in arms and uh i i uh tommy thinks i deserve the medal and the <laughs> other guys think i deserve it, but i don't think i deserve it you know you know people don't know that uh sometimes it's a little harder to observe that medal but that medal belongs every man and woman that served our great nation before me served with me as my comrades and and is serving after me and is serving for all of us right now today uh but a lot of people don't know we've lost two million eight hundred and fifty three thousand who've given the utmost. They gave their Amen. lives mm-hmm. and their 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 uh their families will never have the honor to hold them in their arms and this goes back to that faith. I mean, why I'm still alive or or other people that I know are still alive, I don't know. I don't question it. I just 
take that thing as we were talking about a while ago and being able to hug my children and my grandchildren and my great grandchildren, you know? And, uh, so, uh, so the metal I wear so probably belongs to those two million eight hundred and fifty three thousand. That's that's given the utmost. They've given us to enjoy this great freedom called America, this great nation and as 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 uh Marcus was talking about the cloth, you know, that's the reason I respect that flag so much and respect this country so much because as we continue moving forward in life, it, it doesn't ever get any easier. And, 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 uh, but, you know, just do whatever you possibly could do. And, uh, uh, so continue to understand that freedom is not free. Freedom is written in blood and blood is red. And that's the reason why we need to respect this great nation of ours for all the people who have given the utmost. They've given everything that they could possibly give. So we, you, I, me, Marcus, our kids and our grandkids, and our great grandkids can enjoy their lives of freedom. Amen. Absolutely. Amen. What one of one of the things that I, I always get when I'm out there and and people and I meet people and I'm talking to people is they all want to know about our training. They all want to understand the magnitude. What happens to the individual? What happens to that kid from South Carolina or from from Texas or from Oklahoma when they come together and they're out in that freezing surf? You know, what happens in that process? Could you explain, you know, because back when you went through it, it was totally secretive. There, it wasn't out in the open. There wasn't 50,000 books about it or anything like that. Can you explain, you know, some of the, the core things that really changed in you or were brought out of you when you went through training back in the 60s? Well, I think a lot of it was my father. He said, you never quit and you never give up. And of course, of course, we all know that now. I mean, it's, it's preached. It's like a part of the leadership of going through buds now. And, uh, and, and the great thing about it is, is that, you know, you do make that camaraderie. You do have that, uh, uh, you meet guys like Hal Kirkendall and Mike Lacaz and, uh, Wayne Hampton and Tom Boyhan and, as you go through training, it, it's it's just uh, you, you, it's it's such a a great feeling. It's, it, even even today, at, I'm almost seventy years old. Even today, uh, it just it gives me that big urge of you know an adrenaline pump. But even this <laughs> sitting around and talking to those guys, you know, it's uh, awesome. it's kind of like us. And, you know, when we were when we were traveling uh, around. Uh, all of us with with Rick, I uh, we just had a ball. I mean, we just had, but I mean, getting listen to the young guys, which I considered young back then, but and now they're getting old like me. So, uh, but uh, but it, they it still gives me that that, that surge of adrenaline. It uh, it it just is unbelievable. I don't know. And I thought you got when you went through training, you know. And it's like I said, you know, the, we all had the obstacles. If, everybody faces those obstacles in a different way. And I always knew that, you know, my father said, never quit, never give up. And that's, I, that was one thing that set in my mind. And my dad always said, if it's to be, it's up to me. If it's to be, it's up to me. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so uh, those are some things that I've always, always kept in my mind, no matter how bad the, uh, the, the, how bad it was at that period of time. I just remember daddy said, if it's to be, it's up to me. So if I don't stand up and do it, who, who's going to, cause nobody else is there, but me. So, so uh, going through training, that was what I understood. But the guys that I graduated with, like Hal and Mike and all those guys were, were which were outstanding operators, uh, in, in Vietnam. And they got out, and they continued, uh, uh, with their lives, and um, they did something special in the uh, civilian side of it. And uh, but they still there today to help support our young men and women in uniform. So uh, it's uh, like I say, it's giving back. And I know Marcus feels this way, and as as you do, giving back makes you feel a lot better than not giving at all. So. Mm. Uh, the the best part about our our family our fraternity right is is that everyone's is still around or we yeah. have the reunions that bring us together the new guys have to go out there and i tell you what man when you walk into a room or somewhere or whatever it is it could be a class or 
first thing in the morning, all us young guys walk in, you see Mikey in there or one of those guys, <laughs> man. It's not about what we're fixing to learn throughout the day. I can't wait till the end of the day when that beer lamp is lit and we, I mean, we huddle around like kindergartners during the teacher reading the story. He's just kind of like, has he, has he started talking yet? Has he opened his mouth yet? You got guys on fire. Hey, has he started talking yet? I'm on my way. Tell him to hold on, right? And I mean, it just goes. Melanie's favorite thing to do when all the team guys come around and, and I catch her doing it is she'll sit down on one of the couches, pull a chair over in the corner and yeah. just watch us. It's like when the, when the night's winding down and yeah. we all come in, it just kicking up. Yeah. I mean, and the sun's coming up, right? And we're still telling stories about whatever. And the unique thing about our training that everybody has to go through to, we all have one thing we can touch that's the same. Yeah. Right? That's and awesome. and the, the, the amazing part about it is there is a chance that we're going to be able to get into the same stuff he did. And we talked about this the other day. Every team guy, while you're sitting there listening to one of our warfighters talk about a battle, you're like, Man, I wish I was there. Totally. Every oh, time. Man, I wish every I was time. there. Even the worst ones, like, yeah. I would have died to have been there. Boy. Although I'm I'm pretty sure I'd, I don't think I wanted to be with, with Mike and Tommy on that one. That was pretty crazy. <laughs> well, you know, I tell you, Marcus, Dude, it had to be when epic. you get older in life, you, you guys, you, you young guys, or I still consider you young guys, but you need to start reaching out and going to these reunions because... I tell you, every time I turn around, there's a friend yeah. of mine that's is no longer with us, and I wish I'd have been there. Mm-hmm. You know, it's the reason I tell our my kids to hug their mom and dad every time they get a chance because one day they're not going to be there. And uh, you know, uh, it's uh, I'm, I'm not going to miss too many reunions anymore. I know that for a fact. So uh, that's a great uh, point. You know, man. it's just a com- it's just a camaraderie like you and I get together with Tommy and that time with Aaron Tippin there at uh, what's the name of that? Yeah. That's right. Yeah, and, and yeah, and stuff like that, you know. And I, I, I yelled out and said, "Go, Aaron!" And he said, "Is that you, Big Mike?" You know, hell, Aaron and I were doing stuff in the '90s together, and he still <laughs> remembered who I was. So, uh, you know, and uh, but you know, it, it's it's, and, and the thing is, you know, the camaraderie is still there, no matter what your age is. That the you know. And you call stories, I call them lies. But I tell you, there's a bunch of them flying <laughs> around this weekend. I tell you that. Right there. <laughs> oh man, no, that's actually the great the, the reunions, man. When you because when we get out and we we're trying to find ground on, underneath our own feet by ourselves, and then the, obviously we've been fighting a war for the last 15 years. So guys are always spread out. But the reunions are the great place, especially if there's a war on and, and you've been deployed yeah. to. You need to show up there so the the other guys, the other warfighters can talk to you about it. And then they can hear, and, and there's always that re- relation because it's family. Yep. You're not embarrassed or scared to talk about anything that you went through in front of these guys because you know they've done it. I, I'll tell you what, one of the proudest days of my whole life, I was at the muster at the museum a few years back. And and in the morning, uh, a scout and sw- a swimmer scout from World War II had come up to give some memorabilia. And a guy, you know, was in his 90s and he couldn't even get out of his car. And I remember it was Chief Watson, Watson Patches, Patches Watson. And he goes running, like someone comes up and tells him, you know, hey, this guy's out here. He like snaps to, goes running out there. I follow him out and he you know, talking to this guy, he gives him a bedroll from when he was out in the Pacific and stuff. And they, he shows him this remarkable respect that, and then all of a sudden I'm witnessing this and then patches comes over and we go back and he's talking to this, like uh, Dick Marcinko was there and some other Vietnams and I'm listening to them and show, see their respect for each other. And then some of my buddies who had been over to Iraq, Afghanistan, and it was the most proud moment I'd ever had to watch how we we can spread that love and respect across generations and it's almost like it removes time right mm. oh I, absolutely well, it's like marcus said we're all from the same cloth it's just um you know but uh we have a guy that comes up to half moon bay he's 94 years old he was in and he was in the oudt team and uh the respect that guy gets from my generation, uh, Marcus' generation, your generation, and all the young guys out there to be able to walk up and talk to him. And I said, uh, hey, guys, go up and shake the guy's head and thank him for what he's done for us. 
And he said, well, I don't want to bother. I said, you're not bothering. This is your, this gives him something to continue that faith and to, to live on for, you know. So go thank him. Go up and shake his hand, you know. Sure, it's disrespectful not to. I mean, I, it's kind of like walking up to the Godfather, like you, uh, Mikey or Gallag Gallagher or any of them guys sitting around. And I've, Morgan and I's first reunion, I remember we didn't have any money. And uh, we made we we wrote this sign up to get your picture taken with twin Navy SEALs, uh, three dollars. I think that's how much the beers were. <laughs> I didn't work out, but anyways, I was walking over to uh, to get a uh, a beer and and I well, ran into the a guy. Hell no, the hell no, it didn't work out because my wife said she was scared to death to go up and talk to Marcus and Morgan, and so she she looked at Morgan and she says, "Do you ever smile?" And he says, "Hell no." <laughs> so she said. <laughs> So yeah, not, why we're, uh, not why your team got you're grainy to death. <laughs> yeah, uh, he's <laughs> man, yeah, he's a bit temperamental. But I, I ran into this guy. Uh, I didn't see him. I kind of he ran into my chest, and I looked down. And he had UDT one, Bud's class one, oh, or on his shirt, right. and an old UDT hat right. on. And he was missing an arm and a, and a leg, had a cane, and he looked up at me. And over at my name tag, and I almost wanted to cover it up. <laughs> 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 and he was like, "Hey, meet." Go get me a beer because I'd spilled his. He had it in that one good yeah. hand. I was like, yes, sir. Roger that. I'm on my way. Because <laughs> you're always you a new guy to somebody. Totally. Right? Like you lot. might have been old Danny Deaver. Uh, of course, Al Huey, Captain Shively, uh, Commodore Shively. Of course, you've heard his name. And uh, Al Huey. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, they, they named the camp after Al out at Al, right. Butts. I mean, out of Nylon. And uh, they were great. They were in class two of UDT during uh, Korea. And uh, wow. I had the great honor to work with both those guys. And as, as like you said, Marcus, it's something that you look up to and you respect. I mean, they're, they're heroes in their own boots. You know, they're just continuing. Well, you know, sir, you, you mentioned that. And uh, when you were talking about going up and out of to show respect, the, the fellow who was in his 90s, um, to go up and say hi to him as a, Representative, I guess the younger generation around here. Newbie. You, you sir, were that. Yeah. You sir, were, were that. Were that guy. I mean, you, Tommy. Um, I remember in the hallway there was, you know, it had your photo, the uh, citation from the medal. You guys were what we sought to emulate. Awesome. You know. Well, uh, I, 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 I have a grandson. Yeah, I have a grandson, and he he lives up in uh, L.A. He's a uh, He's a, a financial guy, and he came down to uh, my foundation, helped support a bunch of SIL, from SIL Team 5, and we took him up to the Riviera, it's a golf course up there, and we had wine on them and dined them, and just let them get there, just get back in town, and just letting them have a chance to, you know, get back with him and their wives and have a little bit of time off, and, uh, and so... Um, my uh, grandson met a lot of people up there. The guy, one of the younger guys, about his age, I think he's 24. He said, "Why don't you come on down? I'll show you around Coronado." So he goes down there. He calls me and says, "Mike," I said, "What?" He says, "You really are special." I said, "What do you mean?" I went to all these teams, and it, they all got your picture in there. <laughs> <laughs> that's so true. Awesome. And that's the yeah. true. best part about our. Our fraternity, our family, man, is uh, there's the pictures on the walls of the guys who came before us and what they got into. So as you're coming in every day, man, it's a constant reminder of w what line you're supposed to walk. And I think when we like when we came in, there wasn't any war zone. There was kind of a gap. Well, and, and all that means is, man, that we're just spinning, right? Just getting harder and harder and training. And that appetite gets bigger and bigger. So when it finally does kick off and we go on, you guys know what happens, man. We just... <laughs> take it too far right yeah. just kind of get our back with them but, I hear you. Yeah, <laughs> the tendency to take it a little far but you that's because that how far you guys took it man we it it would be an embarrassment for us i, I always thought to to not carry that line like you did because of how everybody sacrificed so much and that here's the deal with the medal of honor for y'all who aren't familiar with that when you can understand all of them up to that from expert pistol expert rifle all the way up to the the navy cross you walk around with that thing pretty much and and a lot of people won't even know what you're wearing most of the time they just see you kind of your your rainbow on your chest man but throughout our time when that medal the medal of honor has been around when somebody walks in they can be butt naked 
<laughs> like Sergeant Major Pumley, man, you know, he's doing uniform inspection. Uniform inspection. You walk in butt That's naked so with that true. ribbon around his neck. What's up? How's this uniform? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Well, Every time you walk into a room me, across the military. I don't want to see me butt naked anymore. I promise you that. I, five years ago, I swam from Alcatraz to uh, the uh, to the yacht club there in uh, San Francisco, and I gave the we raised like a million, one million two hundred fifty thousand, and I gave the check away to uh, one of the organizations. And uh, the guy said, "Hey, can we take you a picture of the you no know, speedos?" I said, 15 years ago, I might say yes, but right now, hell no." Uh, <laughs> I just got out of that cold ass water. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm right, yeah. <laughs> There's nothing left. I mean, oh, yeah. that, that's a hardcore <laughs> swim i remember i think it was in early 2000s we were going to get a chance to do a, we were going to attack it from the, just like the movie the rock yeah, we were yeah. actually going to do that yeah. we were going to go in and, and take that down and man and it got kanked at the last minute but that's man the currents and the hell of a swim cold, yeah and, and you know sharks and whatever everything floating around in there man it's that's a gnarly swim yeah, but Good job. you, you, you got to learn. You got to understand the currents and how they do, because you got to use the currents. And when it when it goes back going out, you better be close to a shoreline, and you you can curve yourself right in there. But uh, right now, now you you were you're a great swimmer, right? Yeah, I was a I was a good swimmer. Actually, I was I was uh, I, I had dyslexia. You and I have talked about this before, and I just thought I was stupid. But I was a great athlete, and uh, I was a good swimmer, a good runner, and. Uh, myself and Mike Lacaz held the record for quite a while for the obstacle course until uh, uh, until a guy by the name of Baird uh, came through. And he was on the SISM team and used to train. And uh, oh, yeah. I don't know who has a record there anymore, but uh, I, uh, but I had dyslexia real, real bad. And uh, I had to get a 10-point waiver even try to get it in the teams because I wasn't smart <laughs> <laughs> That's so awesome. They must have been hurt. They must have been hurting for soldiers back then. Is all I can say. <laughs> now, some of us have to go out, and there's two ways to get educated. There's the conventional way through schools and college, and that way, when you get out, and you have your diploma, and you stand in front of somebody, they know you're educated, right? right. <laughs> and then there's the education of life, University of Hard Knocks, right? And, yes, buds yeah, that, and then as you progress me, through there, you you learn everything the hard way. But boy, it's in there. I think Mike's got a triple mm -hmm. doctorate right. in hard. Yeah, yeah. PhD in it. <laughs> in like life lessons hard. learned. Yeah. When you're well, talking about it, swimming. It, it, it's, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's all good. It's all good. Amen. You know, uh, Marcus, the other day I was with uh, Jocko. Yeah. And uh, and we were talking about Mikey Monsoor. And when you think oh, about, man. you know, and uh, what a great young man he was. And uh, I... Uh, and, uh, you know, and, uh, it brings back a cause. Like I say, every time we lose a seal, like, uh, it, it takes a little piece of my heart. And, uh, I, I, cause I, I spent so much time out in Coronado talking to the new kids and meeting them and, uh, you know, and, uh, trying to inspire them, you know? And, uh, uh I remember when I talked to Mikey and, uh, before, before we had lost him and, uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, you know, you talk about great qualities of the, the guys that we've known and we've lost and, uh, and it's just something, it's just something super, super impressive about it. So as you and I talk about the gold star mothers and fathers and gold star families and, uh, let's, let's don't forget about those guys. Let's talk highly about their sacrifices as we were talking about earlier. So, Absolutely. you know, and that's what I love about what you're doing out there and, and uh, what you're doing with your foundation and you aren't forgetting those people and God bless you for doing that, my friend. Oh, well, I learned all that from, uh, I learned all that from watching y'all, that kind of thing. I mean, <laughs> and, uh, it, I know, I know you remember this, but I've never talked about it to these guys. Uh, he was the first person I called when I got back to the world. Really? Yeah, as soon as I got out of the hospital in Germany and landed in Hawaii, uh, my first night back to Morganized Place. I checked into the team and come home and uh, called him. Really? Yeah. I was like, what do I, what do? I do? <laughs> He's like, this is about to get heavy. You're about to get catapulted into the, and they were telling me this, but that's why the Admiral pulled me over and then sent me back over. So to give me all that top cover. But yeah, I called Mikey. I was like, Hey man, I'm, I don't know what to do. I grew up with him, you know, yeah. the first thing and he's kind of one of our kids. And it's funny. You were talking about education, not being smart. I've been standing there when you were debriefing presidents. 
Multiple. <laughs> and governors and heads of state, and you get invited to the White House more than anybody I know. So from being from the dirty South and cutting out early in high school, I was just because, man, it was holding you back, I guess. Well, well you, you I, walked one I, hell of a line, done, man. You, you've done me proud, and you consider to doing everybody else proud, buddy. And so if you've... Uh, uh, whatever I had to do with it, God bless it and, uh, take it. And as, but as you continue on with that baton and you continue on doing everything you do for the, your, with your foundation and how you help the, uh, the, the families out there, God bless you. And, they, and they're not just the families, uh, the kids have come back and, uh, you know, uh, they're looking for that support. And uh, that's what it's all about is everybody giving back to make a better life for everybody. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Well, sir, before we wrap up with you, I, I, I want to direct, you know, this question, your answer directly to our listeners, the people out there that right now are, are struggling with a big issue. They're, they're in their combat of life. You know, they're, they're getting crushed by that negative insurgency. They can't get out of their own heads. They're just getting the, the beat down. What are some things that you could recommend that they could do right off the bat to, to give them that break, give them that lull to kickstart that fire and start preparing themselves, start growing and getting better in order to be able to have that resilience and stay in the fight and to surround themselves with a better team? What, what would you recommend to them? Well, you know, uh, we never had a suicide all the times I was in the teams, and then we have them now. But I, I tell a guy, a team guy, if it's just a team guy or any guy, if you see a red flag, identify the red flag and try to get him help. We need to get out there and help these people, and they're struggling. And if you're a good teammate, and that's and, and when I say teammate, I don't care if you're in SEAL team or in the Marine Corps or Air Force or anything like that, because we, as, as we all know that this happening everywhere and, uh, our, our true friend is there for the hard times and the good times. A good, a true friend is there to have your back, no matter what the uh, odds are, or no matter what the circumstances are. A true friend is somebody that's going to stand up and help you. I mean, so if you got a problem and are you somebody out there listening to this right now, if you see somebody that's got a problem and you know, there's, there's a, a major issue, be a friend, help him, you know, or help her or, you know, stand up and then, and, and, and let it be known. And, you know, and, and that's the way, I mean, you're saving somebody's life that way. Amen. Well, sir. Yeah. I just can't thank you enough. Um, it's such an honor to have you on with us. Uh, it's just been, I've been looking forward to this and, and you are everything that I, I've ever heard and, and a whole lot more. And I know you hate hearing that, but thank you for being the incredible inspiration and, and for establishing what the standard is for the SEAL teams and, and in particular for me. And I just am so, so proud and privileged that you could be on with us. Thank you so much. Well, Dave, it's my honor. Marcus, I love you, brother. And uh, you, you my ugly brother, yours, uh, the thing. And, 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 and remember to keep that uh, Superman shirt on there, Marcus. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> All right, buddy. Bye bye. It's been an honor. Bye bye. Dude, I, I'm telling you right now, brother, that, that could have been. What an what an honor, and how humble can a guy like that, who's one of the, I mean, not only the fact that he's got that that medal, but you know he's got multiple combat tours in Vietnam. Back when they do a year at a time over there, right? Oh yeah, Vietnam man disappear into the jungle. Like they they just were like, hey, you guys go out to the Delta. And, you know, when you're done, come back and we'll process you. See if you can get comms while you're out there. Yeah, yeah. Just asking. <laughs> Roger that. We'll check see if we can get some comms. Kind of ditch the radio right here. <laughs> in there, right? Triple canopy shooting a comm shot through there. <laughs> right. And, right and he was in Mac V SOG too, wasn't he? 25 years. Enlisted officer. Vietnam. Comes plugging out of there from the dirty south. Barely got a high school education, man. And just That's tears favorite. a hole in it. He's a big dude, He's too, huge. man. Just a warfighter.
He's, he's, and that, the, the greatest part about it, you know, he gets out and, and he's still walking that line and giving back and motivating people to to come into the uh, military, special force. I, I'll never forget, man, first time I ever met him, the guy <laughs> who brought me in, my recruiter was a SEAL, right. Bill Walsh. Love you, brother. Man, he's like a buck 75 and just hard as nails. Right. I remember when I walked in and saw him, I was like, wait, you're the SEAL? <laughs> you know, that kind of deal, he didn't know, right? <laughs> he would work me like a borrowed mule, man. Just run, <laughs> swim, just uh, crushing you. Man. And then he goes, uh, hey, one of our, one of our, Medal of Honor recipients is giving a, a talk. I want to take you down and meet him. I was like, oh, sure, roger that. So we walk in. He gets up, man. He does his deal. I'm just kind of enamored with the whole yeah. jaw drop. Starry right, eyed, right. yeah. And then we walk up, and, you know, I, uh, him and Bo just kind of went, just started talking shop. He had his trident on and all that. Right. And then I was just standing there. He didn't even really pay attention to me. And then he goes, hey, this is one of my recruits. He's coming in. He's going to Bud's and... You, know, you got anything to say to him? He's like, if I was an instructor, you'd quit. <laughs> That's what he told me. That's it. Yeah. yeah. You'll quit. Yeah, you'll quit. If I was an instructor, you'd quit. <laughs> How'd that make you feel? Oh, I was like, yes, sir. Yeah. I, that's what I yeah, said. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> probably right. You're probably right. Sir. I don't, what, what are you going to say? That's no, the, I dare you. Yeah. That's Mike that's Thorpe. The perfect and, <laughs> hey, you got this guy coming up. I don't even want him to oh, ring dude. in. You know what I mean? In the unlikely event <laughs> that you even survive the first day, mm -hmm. I uh, love making those calls back to the t back to uh, buds too. Or when you get that one of our buddies that calls up, like, hey, you know a guy named because he's dropping every the guys I mentor out here. I'm like, when you get there, do not say my name. Don't say we're buddies. I was like, because that is a one way ticket for a beatdown. <laughs> dude, I always I I, I put a couple two guys through over the last few years and and uh i always call out there and see who's out there and i oh, say sure. hey, this is the one this is name this is what it just you gotta hammer the thought out of them yeah the worst one i ever got so we were starting it was friday before hell week started and my boat crew leader his dad was the admiral admiral smith, smith? yeah and, you had him and you had smith in your class oh yeah oh, oh right. yeah and, and so <laughs> We're all standing up there at attention. He's coming down. He starts down with a Smurf crew, and he comes. We were like the second boat crew. And he comes up, and he stops right in front of us, and he says, all right, gentlemen, you know, gives a good speech. And he looks at the instructors. All right, he goes, all right, instructors, just, uh, you know, make sure you, you give these boys what they need. And he says, and, and if you could, I'd like you to take it easy on my son and his boat crew. Thanks, and Dad. He, yeah, and he smiles, and he, and they, he, dude, all the instructors were just like, <laughs> he's just, brother. It's like throwing a piece of meat into a cage. Bro, for a, we took a man. beat down from breakout till Tuesday morning. They, it was, dude. As if you don't get enough attention. They would search us out. They were a midnight crazy crew. Oh, yeah. They would search. Where's Smith? Where's Smith's boat crew? Over huh. here. <laughs> Uh, they all quit, sir. Was, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, they're over there. Right. Take off right. running. With, not like we could disappear with a big boat yeah, on our right. head, right? You ain't going anywhere. <laughs> oh, my God. That's the best is, is when the days start kicking down towards the end, man, and you think you're stealthy. You're like, all right, everybody hide right here. <laughs> you know, and you literally like, like ride the wide in the middle of the street. <laughs> you just roll see us over and move your boot under. Oh no, there's no way they can see us. No. Park next to a Chevy. <laughs> you get so stupid, you go back to like when you were a kid. If I cover my eyes, no one close can my eyes see and me. stand still. They won't. See. <laughs> or when you're in the water paddling and no one's paddles hitting the water. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> The service uh, actually pushed you back to the beach. Totally. You've got rubber on sand, but you think you're paddling. <laughs> yeah, you're still on, you're on, the, your on, the, on the in the beachfront. <laughs> Nobody realizes it though. Oh my There's god! Instructors are standing there looking at you. What, what's going on here? <laughs> but not one. <laughs> <laughs> and what's awesome is that has been going on since 1943. Ah, uh, you know what uh, I mean. And, and to be able to bring making my, memories since 1943. Making right memories. Now. In the sand in Hell Week since 1943, and and think it like he was saying. Think about the men that we know that we've had the privilege to serve with, or that served before us, or even the young men that are serving right now, who are all cut from that cloth, and what they're doing for this great nation. I mean, what a privilege! I don't, you know, I, I know you both have met him before, but I can't say enough about. And I try to touch on this, but then. I just I felt like I couldn't express it with words that how powerful of an influence he was 
when I was coming up. Wow. I mean, like I said, right there, right there in the hallway, we've got in the case, you've got a citation. How many times it's one big this is before the Back new this is before the say, new yeah. buildings and all that shit. This is one long hallway in the team there. So you always walk past this case. I can't count the number of times, and it really, the only equivalence, and I know this is a little outlandish to, to do, is, you know those what would Jesus do kind of bracelets that was popular? I don't know if yeah. they still do that or not, but, and obviously Mike Thornton is not Jesus, but <laughs> he, he'll my be the point first is, to admit that. it's one of those, when you're, there was something questionable in your mind in the teams, of what, what should I do, or, you know, oh, this is, this is terrible, I won't do anything but this, that shit would come into my head. What would these guys do? Yeah, and it pushes you over the edge. And for me, getting able to talk, being able to talk to him just now was, it's priceless. Oh well, that's why we put those up. Man, them heart every day sucks, yeah. right? And you come walking down, you have to go through that hallway. You're right. Every time you know you stare at the picture yeah, and then you reread you. it and like I don't remember reading that the first time. I read it 500 times, kind of deal. Yeah. And then you just keep like it's like those those guys are watching over you. What? Making you sure cross you cross that quarter deck. They're in the line, yeah, buddy. man. And so what came before you and made what you're standing in. And by contrast, you know what you've also got there? You've got like in a separate space, there would be, you know, like the president's picture, the secretary of defense, the secretary of the Navy. <laughs> Bosses. Nowhere even near the same weight as, as the guys in that case, at least for me. No, I, I Not feel nowhere you. Close or close. You know where I feel that the most hands down right now is, is going into Danny's now out in Coronado and, and, you know, when I, when, before the war started, Danny's was, you know, you just walk in there to, to get crazy. And, but now you walk in in there and every Ryan. single one of our friends faces are on that wall and they're still going up. I mean, they're still going up all the time. And so you walk in there now and there's a reverence that enhanced that connection that I had you know, to another level because, you know, like you're saying, you see certain things that impact you, they cut through all the noise in your life to, to spark something deeper, a deeper rooted connection and commitment to something that's bigger than yourself. And for me, that that's Danny's walking into that shrine and seeing all our brothers right oh, there. Oh, you can go in and have yeah. a beer with all our boys. Yeah. At any given totally. time. Totally. Absolutely. You know, there doesn't have to be another team guy in there, really. You just... And we're not supposed to drink alone, right? So right. you walk in, I ain't drinking alone. Because you get that 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 shot or that whiskey or that beer and put it on the, you know, yep. we do put it on the bar the entire night for yep. them. And then yep. the rest of the night, man, you can just sit in there and have a conversation. I bet civilians think we're nuts because they're sitting there talking out loud to the guys on the wall. <laughs> 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 they think we're nuts, nuts anyways, yeah, but. <laughs> right. well, what are you doing in here? This is a crazy house anyways. <laughs> exactly. Well, listen, if, if, if you're paying, if this is your first show, man, what a treat that you've had to be able to experience the knowledge and tutelage of, of one of the greatest frogmen who's ever lived, quite frankly, in my mind. And, you know, we told the story in the beginning and, and hopefully we did it justice for you. But listening to Mike and his humility and the way he talked about serving others, doing things not for himself, but for his teammates, as a friend for others, hopefully that's set in. And hopefully that's what you needed to hear in your life and going through your hard time. Hopefully that was the spark. That was the spark that's going to ignite that fire in your gut to truly start living a never-quit life. Because you have it. And it doesn't matter where you're from, what your background is. You know, where you grew up, how educated you are. None of that matters. The only thing that truly matters with the never quit mindset is that you serve others and you just don't quit on your teammates, on your family, mm -hmm. on yourself. I just want to thank God and Christ. I want to thank my beautiful children. I want to thank my family and friends. But most of all, I, I want to thank Mike Thornton. I want to thank all the Vietnam vets, SEAL vets. I want to thank all every everybody, every team guy that's come before me, all the team guys that are in right now downrange, all my friends for allowing me to be part of the greatest brotherhood that's ever lived, in my opinion. 
And I want to I, I want to tell the two of you how thankful I am to be here sitting next to you, to be able to do this show, to share our knowledge and to inspire all our listeners. And thank you, listeners, for keep coming back. Without you, we wouldn't even be here. But I want to thank you, gentlemen, because I am truly put privileged. I, it is an honor to be able to wear the trident among you. Same here, buddy. Yeah, thanks to everybody, man, for bringing us back onto the microphone and listening to us. And Mikey, buddy, God dang, it's been so cool to walk on the line that that, that you walked before us, coming from nothing, right? And then now he gets called up to the White House and <laughs> travels the world. America, boy. America. Something else, ain't it? But you're right, boy. Being in that fraternity, man, that's the coolest thing ever. So... Thanks to all the man. Thanks to all the brothers who stepped up to walk that line to just to keep that thing going down, and to every American out there for letting us do it. I mean, seriously, thanks for letting us do that. I mean, y'all come up and thank us for our service, but seriously, thank you for letting us do it because it was an honor to walk among them, right? Amen. I mean, you, this dude's story's so heavy; it's not even funny, right? And just to be able to, you know, go back and forth with with stories that are relative to each other is something and uh having the opportunity to do that was the most amazing thing that this lot you know that these eyes have ever seen or done so thank y'all for that and we'll read the citation for conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty while participating in a daring operation against enemy forces petty officer thornton as assistant u.s navy advisor along with a u.s navy lieutenant serving as senior advisor Accompanied a three-man Vietnamese Navy SEAL patrol on an intelligence gathering and prisoner capture operation against an enemy-occupied naval river base. Launched from a Vietnamese Navy junk in a rubber boat, the patrol reached land and continued on foot towards objective when it suddenly came under heavy fire from a numerically superior force. The patrol called in naval gunfire support and then engaged the enemy in a fierce firefight, accounting for many enemy casualties before moving back to the waterline to prevent encirclement. Upon learning that the senior advisor had been hit by enemy fire and was believed to be dead, Petty Officer Thornton returned through a hail of fire to the lieutenant's last position, quickly disposed of two enemy soldiers about to overrun the position, and succeeded in removing the seriously wounded and unconscious senior naval advisor to the water's edge. He then inflated the lieutenant's life jacket and towed him seaward for approximately two hours until picked up by a support craft. By his extraordinary courage and perseverance, Petty Officer Thornton was directly responsible for saving the life of his superior officer and enabling the safe extraction of all patrol members, thereby upholding the highest traditions of U.S. Naval service.